Welcome to this first episode of Barbells and Bourbon. Well, we won't give too much of an intro because we do that at the beginning of the episode. Uh, this is a project of Andy Askow and myself, Joel Lutke. Um, it's just as a fun way to make sure that we get together and talk every once in a while since we're on uh, kind of opposite ends of the country when it comes to north and south. Uh, with that, we'll talk training, we'll talk science, we'll talk a bunch of other things, plus we'll review some good bourbon, which is also a good way to experiment and try some new things out with that. One FYI, if you've listened to any of our stuff with Clinically Pressed, this is a little bit more heavy-duty in that there is some adult language in it, so please keep that in mind. If you're listening to it, we try and keep it to a minimum, but sometimes when we get going on something, it just comes out. With that, enjoy episode number one. But if you're a principal investigator in a physiology program, just know this is not who I am. <laughs> it's an act. <laughs> and that will keep in the episode. Oh, shit. I'll kick it off. Okay. So, uh, welcome to the first episode, the inaugural episode of Barbells and Bourbon. Yes, sir. We are sitting here on a Thursday night, me and Andy, first one. Um, not as much bourbon as it has been some other things, beer to start with another one, uh, but the whole theory uh, behind this whole podcast is we are going to give more unfiltered opinion. And we are going to hear... Joel's dog walking around the, the <laughs> empty living room. Yeah, as we've moved into a new house and Z's trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Um, but just a little bit more unfiltered on what we think is best practices for lifting, training, what's going on in research, if things make sense, if some research is probably maybe BS or potentially the next big thing. Uh, we'll be doing all those things. Uh, and again, just talking about on topics uh, that we feel strongly about and what we think is the best part of it and not just necessarily throwing that information out but giving a lot more opinion behind it. Along with that, with the name being Barbells <laughs> and Bourbon, that we're going to talk about the training and the nutrition and everything else, we will also be reviewing the bourbon or scotch or whatever it may be that we're drinking that night. And so for this, Andy's coming back from a long summer in <laughs> Illinois a long at the summer. University of Illinois doing a lot of biochemistry research and running. You can dive into it as we go. That's totally above my pay grain. <laughs> but uh, we got him back up in the lacrosse area, so we wanted to do this first one live. And with that, we cooked out, had a nice little evening just hanging out. A bro date. You can just say that. People bro date. Understand. It's a bro yeah, date. Bro date. Well, we got doc. We got the docs. We'll just leave yeah, it at the docs, the docs. Yeah. until they want to get on the episode here. And so tonight I'm amongst the sampler pack of IPAs as Andy, Andy is getting used to them and into them. Uh, we also picked up a Rebel Yell Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. Yes, sir. Um, it, I tried this one out a couple of weeks ago when we thought we were going to do our first episode. Um, didn't work out. Andy was in the lab late, and I don't stay up <laughs> that late, so it worked. Didn't quite work out. Uh, God, what was that one? About sixteen bucks. Pretty, pretty cheap for that version. Yeah. They had a rye that was a little bit more expensive in like the twenty-two range. I'm not gonna lie, for sixteen bucks, I'm kind pretty of, smooth. I'm pretty impressed with it. You know, so I feel like just because people, if they tune in, they're going to enjoy the bourbon reviews, but they're also going to invo- enjoy the, the scientific reviews and our discussion on training, whatever it might be. Just know uh, we have preferences. I typically prefer a sweeter finished whiskey 
So I prefer a lot of sherry cask uh, scotches, a lot of kind of milder bourbons, um, but I this one's pretty smooth. Um, it's distilled and aged by Rebel Yell Distillery in Louisville, which I'm saying that correctly. Because Louisville. The Louisville. So oh, we, have you ever we actually no, I haven't. Oh, we had a very nice city. Do you remember? We're gonna mention names. Trevor Downey. Do you remember that? I don't. So he's one of AJ's. Okay. Uh, and he met uh, a nice young young woman in our program here at UWL, and they're engaged now. Her name was, uh, I believe, it was Jessica. And if I, she won't listen, so whatever. <laughs> but she she's from Louisville. And I always said Louisville, and she. Yeah, I found out that's completely wrong. Yeah, it's, we went it's there for pretty a, offensive. The only NCAA championship that I've officially been a part of when I was at Oklahoma State, we won in Louisville. Yeah, Louisville, Kentucky, and it's the Ville, but it's Louisville. We okay. found out at the uh, athletes' dinner. There you go. But that has been one of my vacations i'd like to go on is the bourbon trail oh yeah i Absolutely. would love to go on the bourbon trail forget kelly you and i can go on a bro <laughs> brocation together to kentucky i'm not gonna lie to you lexington pretty cool flying in over that one with all the horse farms and whatnot really pretty nice it looks pretty nice i've never been so i've been over quite a bit of the united states but never like under the Midwest, essentially, right? Right. So under Indiana, Ohio, Wisconsin, Illinois. I've never been Kentucky. I've never been Tennessee. Yeah, we did the Louisville Slugger Museum. That was cool. Very interesting. Yeah. And some of the history there, because they still make all the bats there. Yeah. Uh, we did not get to Churchill Downs, which I did not realize was that, like, in Louisville. Mm-hmm. Um which we try, we were going to try and get to, but the timing just didn't work out. But that was one of those, like, oh, hey, we're here. Check it off the bucket list thing. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so <laughs> Rebel Yell, it's a, it's a 40% 80 proof. We bought it here a couple hours ago. Apparently, it's an award-winning American whiskey that honors the Rebel in all of us. Uh, there's, with that. there's a little crest on it. San Francisco, San Francisco World Spirits Competition, 2016 gold medal. I give it. I'd give it a. I think we should do it out of five glasses. Out of five glasses, okay. Out of five glasses, we'll give it a 3.8. Fair enough. I I can agree with that. Yeah. We'll have, so, to, we'll have to finagle it. Side note, we also, on the bargain bin, <laughs> as we're walking down the aisle, we see Not Your Father's Bourbon. Yeah, it's uh To go along with Not Your Father's Root Beer, and when it has a $27 price point with a $20 rebate on it, that's just uh, begging you to a try yes a bottle. Go. Always go. Yeah, a bottle of bourbon for $7. Um has a hint of vanilla at the end of it, which we were a little concerned about. Andy more than I was I. very, very concerned about it. And it's much smoother in terms of the finish, not overpowering with the vanilla, uh, but still overall worth the seven dollars once we get the rebate. I would say. Yeah, yeah. I, it's it's it not. Wouldn't be as, my first choice. It would. It would definitely. It wouldn't be my top twenty, but. There was one, and I'm trying to remember the brand, uh, bought, it's a maple bourbon. They make, they make a regular bourbon that's pretty decent. And as, like, celebration for going to an international competition, I was get a nice bottle of bourbon, or what I thought was nice when I was <laughs> 19, 20 years old. Um, I'd have somebody buy me a nice bottle of bourbon, and I always saw this one that was maple, and I understood that it was hint of maple, like maple notes. But I found out after spending 30, 40 bucks on this one, which in college, that's a lot of money, uh, that this one was essentially spiked maple syrup. 
<laughs> and I had to make it. I carried it with me for probably two and a half years. Maple syrup with a hint of bourbon. Yeah, and I, I made somebody else drink it because I just couldn't do it. And I was worried that this would be the same one or something similar to like a crown apple. Right. Which people mainly... If that's what you're looking for, fantastic. Uh, if you're looking for an actual bourbon... No, no so yeah. If you if you if you think you like whiskey and you want to say you like whiskey, you drink Crown Apple or Crown Maple. No offense to good old Doctor Jagum. I who, still like Crown every now and again. Yeah, I don't. I don't think Crown itself is bad, but right. I, I, Crown Apple makes me want to puke. <laughs> if that's what you're into, <laughs> that's what you're into. But anyway, so yeah. Rebel Yell, Kentucky Straight Bourbon, 3.8 glasses out of 5. I Give it a try. Check it out. Again, it was a not overly expensive purchase. Thought we'd give it a try for the first one. May or may not have finished it in a week yeah. to make myself not sound terrible. Yeah. Um, so I think, I it think doesn't an suck on the way down. It doesn't. So I think an important aspect of at least my reviews, and I'm sure you're the same way, you can buy a hundred dollar bottle of bourbon, and it's going to take taste fantastic. But it's a hundred dollar bottle of bourbon. You expect a lot. So right. balancing price point with quality, I think, is what our reviews are going to reflect. Personally, I don't know that I have a sophisticated enough palate, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, to tell you the difference all the time from a thirty bottle, thirty dollar bottle of bourbon. Or even a little bit more, say like uh, was it Elijah Craig? That's your favorite, uh, that or one of your yeah. one of your I, top? Just yeah. be, for all things considered, versus spending a hundred dollars on a bottle of bourbon, I just I don't know that I notice enough difference to justify spending an extra sixty dollars. That's um, fair. I think bourbon. So I, for the frugal bourbon drinker, I think guy. Especially with bourbons, you can get away with uh, a little lower price point. I think more with scotch than bourbon, you get what you pay for in a lot of ways. Well, that's just my opinion. Um, but I think... <laughs> I can get on board with that, especially with the scotch. I think uh, it's time to move into the other aspect. I agree, because we just our, spent 12 minutes <laughs> reviewing bourbon, which is good. Which is important, because that's <laughs> half, half, half the title. The show. <laughs> yes, um, it is. But I think, I think a lot of other people are going to tune in to listen to what we have to say about right. the second half. So we should spend a considerable time uh, discussing that. And I think he introduced the first part. I'll talk a little on the second part. So barbells and bourbon, uh, Joel and I both are avid weight trainers. Joel is a 500-plus squatter, a 600-plus deadlifter. Thanks to my coach, Andy Asko. Yeah, 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 whatever. We uh, we like to call him the strongest athletic trainer in the United States. Uh, he, well, for, we'll for try anyone and prove who doesn't that somewhere. Know, yeah. For someone that doesn't know, Joel is the head athletic trainer at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse and also holds the title Director of Sport Performance at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. Am I... Yep, and you got it. And just to bring this full circle, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I get it. Asco good powerlifter is a two-time because I screwed this up on a clinically press episode. Two-time world champion powerlifter in the junior um, heavyweight. Yep, super heavyweight. Is super heavyweight. One twenty plus kilos. Um, world record in total. I have lift held. still. No, not t- not still. Actually, not uh, still. Okay. Luke Richardson, a uh, young man from the UK, just absolutely obliterated it. Actually, a former teammate of mine wow. uh, from Reactive Training Systems, coached by. Wow. I'm I, I'm not sure if I think. Uh, no, he's coached by Jim uh, Ellie. Uh, he's absolutely a monster. So I've I've held multiple world records at different points in my career. Had a 837 squat. 827. 875 kilos. Uh, that was actually 827 was never a world record. I held the world record at 340 and a half kilos or 750. I held it at 807 or 365, and I held it at 808 or eight, something like that at. Uh, no, it was, yeah, 366. Uh, okay. Just kind of 
semantics at that point, just how you can logistically break world records in competition, uh, defending kind of your title. Right. Um, I've also, the only, only world record I currently hold is the bench press at 235 kilos, 518 point, some change, um, pounds. That's my background. Bottom line, people, we're working with a two-time world champion. I'm not going to lie. I've never been a world champion at anything. So when you get that in the mix, especially a guy that's now 24, four, that's saying something. So yeah. anywho, to give a little background on him, uh, he's currently pursuing his master's degree at TCU. Uh, you want to talk about a quote-unquote meathead that actually has some brains behind it. I dare almost anybody to challenge him on his general knowledge of muscle physiology and how things work if you're not a high level PhD and he's going to go toe to toe with you and still out bench deadlift and squat, <laughs> um, squat with you so uh, you know as much as we can throw accolades around he knows what he's talking about um, to, to be up on the highest research with some of the stuff that's coming out of TCU not only some of the stuff that we've recently been a part of, myself included, with concussion research and how head trauma works, which is something extremely exciting and also useful, for lack of a better term, just in terms of trying to make a game that so many people love safe uh, when it comes to football. Just the training aspects that they look at as well and how to maximize stuff. It's it's pretty impressive stuff, and that's hard to argue with. Um, he trains a couple people that I've known, yeah. and nobody's regressed. Everybody's <laughs> only gotten stronger. It's all luck. Um, yeah, I'm sure. I literally, since I started training with him, God, it's almost two years ago Yeah. now because it's I ran my first and episode. Yeah, well, yeah, I ran my first and only half marathon. I think a little two years ago in like August, and then I tried to find the thing furthest possibly I could from <laughs> half marathon so training, and that was powerlifting. Um, nothing's gone down. It's only gotten better, and that's with some terrible training on my part and just poor timing with job responsibilities, uh, but. Yeah, you got a guy that's talking about stuff that he actually knows, lives, breathes, um, and now we get to see where that evolves into um, weightlifting over powerlifting in the next couple of years, so that'll be something we get to talk about as well down the line, which should be very exciting, so stay tuned for that. But I think uh, I think that literally, if I if I could script, which we're... we're partially inebriated so we're not we're not we're sitting around joel it is 11 30 on a thursday yeah um we already crushed a 12 pack uh <laughs> goose 312 we had help we don't have glasses so we just drank out of bottles but i give that x amount of bottles out of five um <laughs> if, if i could script a perfect transition that would be great and we would use that but it just happened because we're great podcasters, so that's that's just kind of how it falls. The second half of the podcast is all revolved around scientific, logistic uh, recommendations about training. But a disclaimer is, so Clinically Pressed, which is another podcast we're involved with, that Joel is a co-founder with, and I'm lucky enough to kind of tag on to with uh, Dr. Jagum and... Dr. Kyle. Dr. Kyle, who I'm sure you will meet someday if you loyally listen to our podcast. Yeah, he won't be bourbon. He'll be tequila, but yeah. that's okay. <laughs> we can get over it past that. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of that is more a, more, a lot more conservative, trying to trying to disseminate information that's a lot more... Techline's making the complicated simple, taking complicated things that people do yep. across the board, distilling it down so you can apply it to your life. But I, I feel like the 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 disseminated information in that that forum is a lot more a lot more uh, solidly bound to scientific ideology and not that what we're going to talk about tonight or any other night that we happen to enjoy some of this finest whiskey that we can buy for <laughs> a relatively cheap price um, 
It'll is not problem. not tied to science because that that's the way Joel and I both approach life and uh, approach the dissemination and incorporation of information. I think that could be our first topic: science versus practical. Yeah, that could be, and that would be a complete change up from what we talked about about 30 minutes ago. And I'm I'm 100 percent down with that. But <laughs> before we get into what our, our first topic, topic is, yeah, I think uh, it's important to note that a lot of these uh, things we're going to talk about in this episode and subsequent episodes are they're not unfounded in science, but they're a little bit more our opinion than uh, supported by. A, a large amount of research studies, and they, they may be, I'm not saying that we're just going to pull ideas out of our ass, but we're going to talk candidly about what we believe as practitioners in athletic training and sport performance uh, directors and an emerg emerging academic in the field of sports science, exercise physiology, and more recently, protein metabolism, <laughs> even though I would call myself the furthest from an expert <laughs> in protein metabolism. Um, but I think I, I, that's an important point is science, yes, but what we're going to talk about and what we say isn't a blanket statement. Because mm -hmm. I think as you've mentioned to me as a coach for myself and also for other people that I know, the same program doesn't work for every single person. That's that's just not a real thing because we all respond a little bit differently. You know, before I believe was it your first or your second? Might have been your second world title. Would you squat over seven hundred pounds for how many days straight? Oh, okay, yeah, that one. Um, so good. But I'm in, saying, like, yeah, you yeah. wouldn't necessarily prescribe that. Yeah, no, for I, somebody would, I, that would, you're, I would never prescribe it. You're for training almost anyone. I squatted, but it worked for you. Yeah. You said. A world record. You, yes, I did. You yeah. know, you broke a world record, but for anybody you've trained that's competed at a high level of powerlifting, that might not be what they go. So anything we talk about, it's going to be general. You can't necessarily just apply it to you and say, oh, well, Andy and Joel said that this is the way to do it, so it has to work for me. That's That's not the case because it might not work for you because of how your body's made up it's the same thing with training nutrition mobility you, you name it it all depends and i've been watching just out of random happenstance Stu mcgill he's like the ex most the foremost guy, expert yeah. on like spine rehab and low back rehab and low back pain the guy's a genius just watch any of his videos you're gonna love him and hate him all at the same time but his favorite answer to any question that somebody asks is, well, it depends. Yep, there and you it go. truly does. And so while that might be frustrating, we also want to believe that that's the truth. Yeah. It's the hard part about research. It's the hard part about science is you're trying to find something specific with an answer. And it doesn't always exist. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> I feel like because it's all how you apply it in my personal point of view I feel like uh, a perfect uh, we're we're just the best podcasters on the planet compared to Joe Rogan uh, Barstool Sports whatever I'm not saying it if we could get that many followers and shares we'd really appreciate it yeah we, we probably won't but <laughs> so another perfect transition to a topic that we we did not agree upon prior to this episode uh, science versus practice. So he just brought up the idea of interperson variability, and, and I can only speak from a coach and as a researcher and as an athlete in powerlifting, if you want to call me athletes, because <laughs> if you know what I, I, I portray myself as, we're not athletes, we're just lifters. But more specifically, as a researcher doing human subject research, Really, a lot of this stuff that we we recommend and that we we find in these studies is is pretty 
if you want to look at it this way, it's, it's useless because we, we find it in N equals a big exercise physiology research in the, in the type of research we do, which is human performance and trying to make athletes bigger, stronger, and faster. A big, a big subject population is 20. That's 20 people that we're trying to, we're trying to make a statement in which in whatever Millions location that people. you're at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, technically... Because uh, I'm sure 20 Texans out of the Dallas-Fort yeah. Worth area is totally equivalent to 20 people from across Wisconsin. Yeah, I, I'm Look a, I'm a graduate student in uh, kinesiology, but uh, an exercise physiology focus at Texas Christian University. And my lab is the Exercise and Sport Performance Laboratory uh, at TCU. And we do research in how to augment uh, power performance in athletes, which is a fancy way of making them more explosive, essentially, um, because power Science. is the product of force and, and velocity. So if you can create more force faster, you're more powerful. And that translates in general terms to athletic performance, which is the assumption we work off of, which is the first flaw of every study we do, that if we make a, an athlete more powerful, we're going to make them a better performer in whatever sport there is. But we all know of people who are freak athletes, who we played with in maybe high school or middle school, who were just explosive and they could they could run fast and jump high and move heavy objects very authoritarian uh, and those people never translated to good athletes but then we know these slow kind of non-talented people who never never could do anything impressive in their life but turned out to be pretty respectable athletes and vice versa, where cra crazy freaks turned into good athletes with no talent, no skill performance, but uh, people who were slow and not strong didn't, obviously. Um, we work on these assumptions that these people, if we augment one specific performance variable, we're going to make them better athletes. And that doesn't necessarily transfer because people are hugely variable. The human model is a crazy model to work with, but it's also the most most valid model to work with. We can do all this animal research we want in the whole world and it might not translate to uh might not translate to a, a valid approach in which to augment these these characteristics in people. And further, uh I think people put a lot of a lot of worth into what their favorite experts say in the field. Whether it's, uh, I'm not going to mention any names because I respect a lot of the people uh, who are popular in social media, but what X person says is not necessarily what X science reports, and what X science reports is not necessarily what the best possible outcome for you is. So, it's, it's a lot of people perpetuating these ideologies that aren't necessarily translating to better performance. And you see it, the best, the best reference I have is in the supplement realm. Oh, God. <laughs> so, people, people just find one positive finding. Right. And, and a great, uh, I will mention this name because... I am strongly against this person. Um, a great example is with hydroxymethylbutyrate, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, a supplement that mixed reviews, but there is a couple studies by Jake Wilson at the University of Tampa, who he published findings. Who happens to be the on social for people to find him. Yeah, he is definitely on social media. Is he now has his private laboratory. Muscle PhD. Uh, what's his? I yeah, believe I think, so. I believe so. Worked with BPAC. He might have worked with Ben Pakulski, Um at one point in time. I used to follow Ben uh, on a high level. He's doing his own thing now, which seems with to be MI40 or whatever. Yeah, yeah. very I, very I don't bodybuilding him much focused. But it is, I yeah. believe 
I know who you're talking about. So Jake has run a not only an HMB ATP, but he's run a couple studies that are a, a little bit uh, suspect in their findings. Specifically, gaining and I, I don't remember. It was like nine kilos, nine point two, I think, kilos of lean mass in twelve weeks. Uh, That's so like twenty pounds plus. A training study where these these people gained a considerable amount of weights, like <laughs> androgenic hormone, exogenous steroid use levels of fat-free mass in twelve weeks in these. Just everything about the study just screamed something not good. Um, and he published these findings, and people, some people found them as extreme explanation as to why HMB ATP is a useful supplement, and others logistically said <laughs> that's not realistic. So if you don't know how to interpret findings from a study, even if you can understand, which is unlikely, the statistics in a study, and you can critically evaluate how these studies were run with popular methodology, just the finding, if you don't understand the current body of research, it's a little bit hard to uh, understand. I haven't read it yet, but there's a book out there called Bad Science, and there's also another one called Lying with St- with statistics. Statistic. Yeah. <laughs> yep, that one. <laughs> um, I've heard both are really good. I've heard them on multiple recommendations that science is science until it's not, and it's massaged yeah, and yeah, yeah. whatnot and reworked to get the outcome that supports. And this is a whole other topic for another day, which I think would be really good, especially with your tract and potentially mine in the future of just like if you want to find something and the data you collected there's a way to massage things to get it to do what you want it to do and it sounds like that's the case with you know hmb is it truly like a miracle supplement in my life i don't want to even go back and figure out how much money i've Wasted, wasted useless cause supplements. It's, cause, it, yeah. it is wasted. It's not even like a, oh, like, I feel a little bad about it. No, I wasted money. Yeah, yeah. Straight up wasted money, definitely in college, on stuff that just didn't bring it home. Um, and this kind of seems like the next thing. Like, there's no miracle supplement that's going to do this for you. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if it's... Man, we're, potentially we're just, HMB. We're just incorporating. So originally, before the episode, we decided on training as a general recommendation. What we think is good uh, recommendations in the literal, most general sense, and that's what we agreed upon. And I'm having mixed thoughts about what to bring up next. Uh, <laughs> one of those is so everyone's looking for the the miracle pill or the miracle powder or whatever it might be crossfit to crossfit and paleo to uh to and Reebok. augment their their you goal whatever dog. it is fat loss muscle gain strength power whatever it is it's probably not a legitimate avenue by which to uh dedicate your time or effort but another one is is uh, continuing down this statistical road, which I don't think, I think you, you said it best. It's it's a whole nother episode, but I will touch quickly upon. We just did. I don't I don't think it's hit YouTube yet, but we just did an interview with Greg Knuckles. Not yet, but it will come out with Clinically Press. There we go. Uh, yeah, Clinically Press. We'll call YouTube. it episode fifty one. We might as well make it the next one. Yeah, there we go. Coming out. In a week, probably, by the time this gets out. Yeah, there we go. So, uh, we did an interview with Greg Knuckles, and I think... You give a slight background on Greg, yeah, just so, so people can... Greg, uh, if you don't know who he's he is... why he's legit to listen to. If you don't know who he is, you should look him up. He's a current master's student at UNC Chapel Hill, which is a hugely reputable program in oh, exercise, exercise science is, absolutely. and kinesiology, whatever. Concussion, they're usually the they're, forefront. So, he's he's doing great work there uh, furthering his formal education but more so than that he does huge work in 
I don't want to call it this because it, it kind of degrades the effort and the quality of the work he puts out, but informal scientific education. Uh, he owns a website called Stronger by Science, formerly Strength Theory, uh, which is a play on string theory of uh, uh, physics. Uh, but that's whatever. Uh, I digress. When you watch it, you'll understand. He owns uh, Stronger by Science, by which he and a, a plethora of other very reputable authors kind of review research uh, and translate very scientific ideology into more layman's terms, which sounds like a bad thing, but as a researcher myself, sometimes I need to read his website to understand some of the the ideas that are out there because science isn't made for people who don't have advanced degrees uh, and further than that even even more than just stronger by science he also writes a research review with Eric Helms and Mike Zordos called Mass which uh, they they do more of a formal scientific review and write very um, high impact articles that a lot of people can benefit from and just as somebody who follows them I know I, I can't say when this episode comes out but right now which is July or August fuck August 2nd they're having a sale summer's over yeah summer's, summer's over, over. Um, football starts a sale. in seven freaking days Greg is essentially a uh, hugely knowledgeable I, I can't say I know anyone who's more knowledgeable on the current body of total literature because he's just a freak uh freak with his memory and also a freak with just wanting to know something about everything and he he puts out these ridiculously well written articles that are well thought out and whatever so that's a quick background on Greg we did an interview with him uh, for Clinically Pressed episode 51 as Joel said it'll come, come out, out probably, probably a week, week or two from now when you're listening to this so I don't know when that's going to be but if you listen to this before August 15th sign up for Clinically Pressed email episodes to win some free stuff there you okay. go shameless plug 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 plug, plug, plug. Uh, Greg was talking about a very specific uh, dig he has with research statistics by which people can make claims that aren't supported by their data you call them bullshit basically yeah <laughs> It, it, he was very nice about it. But yeah, it was it was very interesting to hear his point of view. It, yeah, it, it always is. Um, so if you if you don't, and he has an epic freaking beard, so you gotta listen to him. He does. Um, if you don't understand a popular research methodology, b research statistics, and c just research as a whole. I don't feel as though you can completely critique research in a meaningful way. And I think just the fact that Greg is in a master's program right now so he can do actual research is a huge uh, indicator of this because what Greg cares about is perpetuating ideologies that are supported by research. And I think he realized at some point that you can't fully understand research if you've never done it. Uh, the old, the age-old saying, "Don't knock it till you rock it." And I, that was the thing that I think was the most meaningful for m me to hear him is, "I haven't done this. How can I critique it?" Now he's going to, and I believe it was a fairly ambitious study, but you got to give credence to it. Coming full circle, and I'll let you finish to our training. We had our opinions on CrossFit last summer. Yep. We went down before the CrossFit Games. We didn't get a chance to see them necessarily, but we got to talk to a bunch of people, and I've got to believe, I know mine, and even from what you've said, like mindset changed on CrossFit and what these guys do, and now just kind of learning a few more things about it, I think it has changed, but... 100%. We weren't, we weren't around it that close. Yeah, yeah. But then when you meet the people... My opinion changed, or at least broadened. But anyway, back to Greg. Um, Sorry. But we no, it's fine. 
we were talking about very specific gripes um, with research statistics by which people can hide what their data represents um, in a way that's um, kind of deceptive. But we've talked about this for quite a while. Um, I think we can do a quick discussion because <laughs> we've been going for a little while and it's been a little bit rambly. Um, but we've we've talked about a, a kind of a plethora of topics and that really is what we're going for here. So we're... Deal with it. Yeah, yeah. Episode one. Episode one. You're getting a taste of everything. We're going to talk about training. We're going to talk about whiskey, which is the most important aspect of this podcast. But as a supplementary approach to gain followers, because we're sellouts, we're also going to talk about training. We're going to talk about research, kind of the most uh, up-to-date things that we've read, um, kind of critiquing and trying to understand more relevantly popular studies that are coming out nowadays that maybe meatheads are going to be pretty susceptible to reading and interpreting where they might not be <laughs> the most qualified to do so. Um, on that topic, can we just say anything that you hear on the news, local or otherwise, that says, a recent research article has said, "Yeah, it's go and visible. look at it. Download it if you can. Read through it. See if it makes your sen- makes sense to you. That's my biggest and one. And realize, so... The Reader's Digest said lettuce is terrible for you. Yeah. Okay, could we talk about the nutritional content of iceberg lettuce versus, like, a spring mix? Absolutely. Iceberg lettuce, basically you're eating crunchy water because there's yeah. nothing to it. Is it going to help you? Probably not. But is that better than the fries, the fried and deep fried whatever? Who's you know? Yes. How many people are going to argue with that? But that's just it. Like you yeah, yeah, look yeah. at these research studies and the ridiculous shit that we research, and how people get funding for this, I still haven't figured out. Because you apply for funding for something that in theory makes a lot of sense, and you get nothing. Be careful on anything you hear on the news, because as you've probably figured out with the climate that we're in, it's all headlines it's all attention grabbing and so please be careful with those um and to be honest with you i think that'd be a great little segment for us in the future future if you hear something or we do we'll definitely keep an eye out for it that we're like yep that's full of crap work out for 12 seconds and you'll lose weight we might have an opinion on that if uh, here's here's the most general rule if it sounds too good to be true, it is. Absolutely. So, so a lot of a lot of popular news outlets want to come up with the All of them. flashy headlines that people are going to read, and it, it generally centers around losing weight or becoming more fit, stronger, whatever, more toned. Which I, I'm not sure what fully that means. Um, you can't lift weight, lighter weights for more reps and get toned. That's not a real thing. Yeah, I've, I've had to explain that more times than I care to mention. I don't know fully what that means, but a lot of popular news about they, think about it this way: if you go to if you go to a restaurant, they're going to try to pitch everything as a healthy alternative. You you can see this the second you start going through a McDonald's drive-through. Oh, new healthy option. That's bullshit. They're there to sell you more burgers, sell you more food. Right now at McDonald's, a healthy option as a salad will give you salmonella. So be careful. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone, Everyone's pretty, pretty logical when M- McDonald's says we have healthy options. They're like, no, you don't. You just don't have an option for me that's going to be better than any other relatively shitty food I'm going to eat. You just don't. But yet, any time the Washington Post or New York Times comes out with this article that says X is really good for Y, people go nuts. 
and going back to exactly what I was talking about 15 Dr. years Oz ago. Dr. Oz and all his BS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And getting called in front of Congress. This is the miracle drug. That That's not a thing. It's a bastardization of the scientific process. And like I said, going back to what I was talking about 10, 15 minutes ago, the layman just isn't equipped to interpret or understand research. And that's not a bad thing. I'm not, as a, a scientific researcher in my master's, I'm not equipped to understand a blueprint and make proper piping. I'm going to leave that to a fucking plumber. So why is somebody... You got a plumber and electrician coming to fix their house. Yeah, Next there you week. go. You're not going <laughs> to have a fucking scientist and a fucking garbage man come to fix your house? No, because that'd be dumb. We're just not equipped to understand what's necessary. Right. So why is somebody who has a, a bachelor's, maybe an MBA or a master's, equipped to interpret and understand very advanced scientific ideals that are published in academic journals. They're just not made for the layman. And yes, they're, well, I have this, this conversation with, if, if anyone's listening who's interested in science, we have this conversation, uh, me, uh, a lab mate of mine, Jason Stone, and uh, a principal investigator at the University of Illinois, Nick Bird, we have this conversation about the translation of research into essentially layman's terms, which by which it becomes applicable and useful to the everyday person. And yes, there's a need for that, but the system is flawed in that principal investigators are concerned with getting grant funding so yep. they can bring on more students and create opportunities for their their students who they already have in their laboratory. Well, there's no funding for retrials. you got to come up with something new and exciting. Yeah, it, it all has to be novel. So these these ideas that scientists should translate their, their research for laymen is just not logistically plausible in that <laughs> they essentially have better shit to do. As Joel's checking his email at midnight. You got people. People need shit at midnight. No, they don't. Story of my life. Get they a think phone. they do. Get a flip phone. <laughs> I would love one. Shout out to Dr. Wright. Flip phone. <laughs> yeah. I'm not. So I, I think we've been rambling on for quite a bit. Uh, We're 45 minutes in. 45 minutes. So. I don't think Wrap it up. It, yeah, I, I, the key I don't points. think we were particularly structured, uh, structured, but I think that that's probably beneficial for our first episode. I agree. We kind of gave it lays insight. out the groundwork for all the things that we're probably going to talk about at some point in more detail. So we we in kind of intentionally didn't structure this episode so that we that maybe rambled a little bit. Beers later. Yeah, yeah. We had a case of beer plus some IPAs, plus some sour beers, whatever. Um, we intentionally didn't structure this episode so highly that we were constrained to a particular topic because we kind of wanted to give you an insight into what, uh, in, it, in its entirety, that we were going to cover. And we weren't able to do that because there are topics that are just going to come up that are pertinent at the specific time but aren't pertinent now. We're basically going to cover whatever we feel is is relevant. If it's a new study that comes out that sweeps social media, uh, if it's a particular supplement or particular training strategy by which people are going nuts over, we want to give you our opinions, and you may value them, you may not. And on top of that, we're going to review bourbons and scotches and other whiskeys, but... So if nothing else, you'll learn how to discern crappy science, things that probably aren't going to make you where you want to get to, training versus working out. And learn good That, that good needs whiskeys. to be a topic. Yeah, yeah. But at the end, I'll be all, if you're into bourbon, whiskeys, or scotch, we're going to let you know what we think is pretty good. Yeah. I have a, I have a couple... Uh, I think we should make it a rule from now on. We should 
maybe both were viewed different. Yes. And then at some point, so we should trade off between scotches and bourbons. Which I think, I think we can go both ways. Like throwing it out there. Got a little bit McAllen Twelve left. Happily review that and whatnot. Got some other stuff. Shout out to Coach A's. If you haven't followed U of L football, Monday meals with Coach A's. Priceless. We're hoping it breaks the internet at some point. Got a little Door County single malt whiskey coming in that we're going to review. Uh, so that might be a uh, delivery for some people, even though if you're in Wisconsin, apparently you can't, which is the dumbest rule I've ever heard. But that's okay. Um, yes, we will definitely review different things as some of this will be from a distance as we're most of it <laughs> how many 985 miles apart part? um so there'll be a lot of that where we'll both review what we are drinking on that night which is the perfect excuse for me to try some new bourbons and whiskeys and scotches which and kelly can't even get mad at you exactly it's just business, it's we're, business. we're trying to make some money shout out to whiskey advocate Want a sponsorship? <laughs> hey, we're talking to you. This one's on us. Yeah. Um, good we'll magazine. You Check one. it out. They got a lot of good information, but couldn't agree more. Um, neither of us are so set in our ways, I would think, that we aren't opposed to new viewpoints. To new viewpoints, exactly. Um, God, we just did an episode for Colony Compressed earlier, uh, which will be out in a few weeks might be a month um and we talked about this deeply of just like going back to this hold the standard summit that dr kyle and i went to is if you're not trying to actively prove yourself wrong in order to a find a better way or b affirm what you're doing what the hell are you doing you're not trying to progress and so this comes back to a guy that we were following. They run a program. Their general performance preparation program. Their GPP. How do we get the general person into the best state ever that they can be? They haven't found something better than CrossFit. A version of it. Yeah. They tweak it and edit it. Their point is until somebody comes along and says that's good, this is better, and when they can prove that it's better, they will switch to it. Until that time, they're going to stick with what they know to be the best, and I can't argue with that. And that's what we're going to give you guys is what we know, what we've seen, what we've practiced, what we've gone through personally as the best, we're not going to fill you with a bunch of BS case in point talking back to you know Andy I mentioned I squat 545 I have deadlifts at 645 I suck at bench press it's like 350 <laughs> but whatever we'll get over that um, his sucking at bench press is like a lifelong goal for a lot of people just put that out of, there some of the athletes would be like well, what supplements do you take <laughs> I drink a protein shake if I remember after a workout, I take vitamin D, C, fish oil, and a 2.5 gram dose of creatine, which most people, if you've read the research, will show is maintenance at best. Yeah. Not loading, not even on the high end of maintenance, it's the low end. It's not a supplement or anything like that that's, that's doing it for me. Yeah. It's how I respond. And that's what we're going to give you guys is the tried and true, back and forth. This might work. This might not work. You've got to find out what works for you. Is, and that's what it comes down to is you. I think a lot, uh, a lot of value comes from Joel and I don't agree on everything. So we're there's a very good chance I might say something that he disagrees. I would love to argue yeah. one time. <laughs> yeah. I'll just cite science. Blindly, <laughs> just turn into one of those zealots that doesn't understand. 
but Joel and I don't agree on every training modality, specifically every recovery modality, because he's he's a lot more well versed in that stuff than I am. Uh, so the powerlifting things, or even some of the lifting things as well. But an important notation of that is, if you're logical, you can apply X to Y in a conservative way. So he might not know powerlifting on a high level, but at the end of the day, powerlifters are just strength and power athletes. So you can you can classify almost every athlete into a very specific category. And if X works with a, a long jumper who's a strength and power athlete, theoretically it, it might work for a power lifter. And I think I think we add value to that discussion in that we don't agree with everything and both of us are willing to be wrong. Oh, for sure. Yep. Prove me wrong. Show me something different. Change I'll my adapt mind. It. Absolutely. And I'm not going to just argue with you because this is how we've always done it. Yeah, yep. I think uh, I think that's a great end to the first episode. Hopefully for the next one, we'll be a little bit more structured. Um, we'll have a bigger topic yeah, that yeah. we're focusing on. But first episode, check out. Rebel Yell. Yeah, Rebel Yell. Even, not your father's bourbon. If you're looking for something a little sweeter, our good buddy, Doc, we'll leave it at that. Tried it out. Not a bourbon drinker. No, he liked it. Not a hard liquor drinker, period. He drinks Coors Light. Diet Coors. Yep, absolutely. Um, he goes, oh, if I can handle that, that's not that bad. So, that tells you something. Give those a check out. Um, if you're in the lacrosse area, Festival Foods, $26.99 with a $20 rebate. Hard to go wrong with a $7 bottle of bourbon. Uh, we'll give it a try. Uh, but other than that, it's I'll good to have you back time. north. Yeah. God, I can't wait till you come back up here. But yeah, yeah. Um, next episode soon will be soon. We'll try and get these as regular Hopefully as we can. Before uh, school starts and we both get fucking nuts. And with that, we will call in. You'll be able to hear everything. Uh, we'll do it via Google Hangout. You know, I think it'd be fun sometime. We'll get there. Um, maybe try and invite some random guests in for questions and whatnot. I think that'd be good. Uh, but until then, barbellsandbourbon.com. Not a whole lot going on there yet. We'll get it updated. Check it out. Apple Podcasts, we'll get it up there. YouTube. Um, Instagram will be on uh, as much as we possibly can and we remember. Uh, but yeah. Check us out. We started <laughs> out. This is going to be a lot of fun. We look forward to it. So, with that, we'll um, catch you guys next time. God, we got to come over with a catchy tagline. <laughs> Bye. Cheers to bourbon. Cheers to bourbon. Or cheers to barbells and barbells. Barbell. Have a good night, everybody.